You know, from time to time, I see things that have been done on these older Mercedes-Benzes that kind of make me cringe. And they have to do with one of two things. Either the, the way the repair was done or improperly done, number two, and how much it cost the owner. I mean, literally, sometimes I just go, oh, ouch. So I, I really want to share these things with you when I come across them because I know they can save you hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars. It's really encouraging to get emails from people saying, Kent, you just saved me a couple thousand dollars. Puts a big smile on my face because, you know, I'm Dutch, so I understand. I don't know where the D Dutch got this uh, reputation of being frugal, but, you know, you talk about Dutch dates and Dutch this and Dutch that. So I'm going to call this my Dutch method or my Dutch approach to car repair. And that would be twofold. Number one, do it right. And number two, save money. Sometimes save big money. So when I see situations arise, I'll throw those up onto YouTube and call them, here's another story, another Dutch method success or whatever. <laughs> so the Dutch method involves, you know, a couple key points. Number one, is you want to isolate the problem, you know. Now, I want to encourage you out there who may not do your own work on your own cars because either you don't have time, you don't have the garage or whatever. But at least if you follow these steps, you can still save hundreds of dollars and sometimes make sure that it gets done right because you're gonna be on top of it. Anytime you have a problem, you need to isolate the problem. You really need to isolate. Okay, what is it? Where is it? If you can't isolate it, you say, oh, I got, like sometimes somebody will say, I got this strange noise in the front of my car. Can you help me fix it? I can't help you fix it. I have to isolate the problem. And I can't do that via email, okay? You can't believe how many of those type of emails I get. Hey, I've got this noise in the rear end, or I've got this squeaking going on. What do I need to do to fix it? Well, I can't, I, I got, got to isolate. That's number one, you have to isolate. And then number two, you need to do some research. If you're not willing to do some research, get online, do some research. It's, it's amazing what you can discover online today. You're not willing to do that, then I can't help you. You're not really that interested in saving money because, you know, there's no free lunch and sometimes you're going to have to have a little sweat equity into the problem and that sweat equity is getting online and doing some research. And then third, you're going to have to come back once you do the research and do some additional testing. Because number four is when you want to go out and buy parts. <laughs> And that's what most people do first. They'll hear about a problem, they'll go online, they'll go to YouTube, they'll go to some forum, and somebody says, well, what's my problem? Oh, buy this part. So you buy the part and you put it on. Oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> so I'm going to harp on this and harp on this until I can't do any more videos on YouTube, and that's diagnose the problem before you spend money or get parts. And then, you know, right in the mix of all that is the principle to do the easy thing first. You know, you think, okay, I need to buy some parts. Uh, it could be this or it could be that. And what I'm going to say here on that, this is like number five. You, if you're going to gamble with parts before you absolutely know what the problem is, then I put a maximum of $100. Because... If you go have the car tested at a shop or have run diagnostics on it, it's probably going to cost you $100. So if you think that I could replace this part and I might fix it and it's under $100, I don't have any problem with that. But if it's a two, three, four, five hundred dollar $500 part, diagnose a problem. If you can't do it yourself, take it to somebody who can run proper diagnostics on it so you can go out and buy the part. So the parts, the actual parts purchase is the last thing you do but I'm not opposed to gambling under $100 because you see where that comes from. That comes from the, well, how much is it going to cost you? What about the time to drive it and leave it somewhere, go back and pick it up? So even if it's less than $100, it, you, you know. And I, and I think there's an example here. I'm not sure. Now, I'm speculating. I have the maintenance records for this car. This is a 2003 Mercedes. It has the V6 M112 engine, which I'm very fond of, only has 100,000 miles on it. And I've got some really interesting maintenance records. And I was thumbing through them, and one caught my eye. 
And this is back in 2015, so that's just a couple years, you know, a couple years ago or a little more. And the mileage is 88,000, so, you know, 12,000 miles ago. And I'm going down here to see the total invoice for $1,300. Anytime I see invoices over 1,000, I look at them very carefully. <laughs> and I'm looking at this, it says alternator, $451. And I go, man. I've replaced a few alternators on these M112 engines, and uh, they cost about 125. You know, maybe if you go in the dealer, it's going to be more. But if you just shop, you can go on Amazon <laughs> and get an alternator for 125 dollars. So I go, whoa! And then I'm looking over here, and I'm going labor to install it, 176 dollars. So you're looking at, oh, you know, 650 dollars or something like that to replace the alternator. And you think, well, the person just took it in there and had it fixed. You know, that's just the way it is. You know, the shop, that's what the shop is going to charge. But is that what you want to pay? But the other thing that bothered me here was I've worked on a lot of cars over the last 20 years. They're all Mercedes Benz. They do have alternator problems, but they hardly ever burn out an alternator. It's always the voltage regulator. <laughs> it's that little, you know, $25, $30 part that burns out. I even have videos on how to carry those in your trunk as an emergency backup if you should ever use a voltage regulator on a trip because the only time I ever got stranded on the freeway in any car my entire life was in a Mercedes-Benz where the voltage regulator burned out, the brushes wore out and it could no longer charge. This was a gasoline car so it just quit going down the freeway. <laughs> I'm very attuned to voltage regulators and alternators. So I think in the 20 years that I've been working on these cars, I've only replaced two alternators that actually failed, the alternator itself. All the other times it's been a voltage regulator. So you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Let's back up and say, okay, this was the situation that happened to you. Right away you isolate the problem. Number one, isolate the problem so you're going to say, okay, how do I know it's not the battery? How do I know, you know, it's the alternator? See, so you, you need to do some testing. You need to isolate it, you know, just with a voltmeter. You can kind of determine, is my alternator putting out or not? It can, it's a very simple test. There's lots of YouTube videos out there on how to test your alternator with a simple voltmeter just to make sure it's putting out voltage. It may not be a 100% test because it's not testing the amperage output, but it's at least showing, okay, there's voltage going into my battery. A super dead alternator will be nothing. You put the voltmeter on the battery, you start the car up, nothing changes, okay? Because there's nothing going into the battery. So you would have done that. Okay, number one, isolate the problem. You say, okay, something's happening with the charging. Next thing you do is you check the wiring. Make sure the plug is okay. <laughs> I think there's been a few alternators changed just because the wiring plug was shorted or corroded. So be sure and check that plug or contacts into the alternator. Then you're gonna do some research and you're gonna find out, whoa, Mercedes-Benz alternators have a little voltage regulator on the back that can be replaced and that's the part that generally fails if that were your situation you say okay i'm going to now go to a shop let's say you don't want to do the work yourself and say okay i have a charging problem you're going to tell them what the problem is you're not going to ask them to diagnose it you can say i've already checked my car out i would like to know how much it would cost to replace the voltage regulator you can go ahead and test it. If it's not the voltage regulator, then report back to me before you replace the alternator. So you might even ask, what would the cost of an alternator be? And if it says $451, you're going to say, well, just a minute. I can buy an alternator on the internet for $150. It can't be that much. You know, and if, if they say, well, tough, well, then I would recommend you go somewhere else and have your car fixed. But if you were to do this yourself, I have a kit on my website for this engine that comes with a voltage regulator and complete video instruction. Now, it's not the easiest job in the world, but with lengthy, detailed video instructions and a few tools, you can do this yourself in a couple hours. So it's kind of your choice. You know, if you want to spend $650, that's your choice. It's your car. If you want to spend two to 300, do a little more research, you know, make sure you, you, you get all your ducks lined up and then take it into a shop and say, okay, this is what I want you to do. What's it going to cost? Because that puts them on the alert that you know what you're talking about. Okay. And of course, then if you only want to spend $50, you go ahead and do it yourself. Now, remember in this example, I'm speculating. 
I can't tell you for sure. Maybe the alternator did burn out. It's a piece of electrical equipment and things can happen, okay? So I don't want to rag on mechanics. I don't want to say this poor owner got ripped off. I'm just pointing out some possible scenarios. So this is that kind of that first story I want to tell you. I've seen some alternators put on improperly. And the bolts have loosened up and the bolts have come out and gone through the radiator. So, you know, you want to get it done right? <laughs> So that's the key to the Dutch method that I'm trying to promote. Learning how to do it right, and at the same time saving money, big money. We're not talking about saving 50 bucks. Because all of our time is valuable, my time is valuable. And you know what I'm gonna do in this next one? On the same car here, I'm gonna show you how I saved about five to six hundred dollars in a little over an hour and a half. Now, I'm busy, you know, and I'm sure you're all busy, but for six hundred dollars for an hour and a half work, <laughs> <laughs> That's worth it, okay? I remember I'm Dutch, probably $200 would be fine for me, maybe even 100 okay? So, but in the third example that I wanna share on this Dutch approach to car repair, I'm gonna show you something that I did on this car that possibly could have saved another person up to $4,000. Following this method, you know, isolate the problem do the research, come back and do some further inspection and testing, consider the risk of how much the parts are gonna cost and whether or not you're gonna get them without professional opinion. And then the last thing is to buy the parts. So I fix this problem, that, you know, this one I'm gonna share in the third of the series, I fix this problem for $28 that probably could have cost some people four thousand dollars and you're gonna be kind of surprised when you learn about that one so this is kind of the introduction i'll continue this series if i get enough interest but i want to from time to time come on in here and say look what i saw or look what i read and i want to warn you okay there's a better way to do it